Good afternoon and welcome to today's campus conversation focused on the work of our One Campus IT Operations Working Group, otherwise known as OSITO. My name is Rose Martinelli and I'm Vice President of Strategic Initiatives and I'm pleased to moderate our conversation today. I am pleased to be joined by our three co-chairs, Margaret Shadell, Matthew Therakin, and Ara Zadok for this conversation. We plan to share a bit of an overview of our work today, results from the survey, and save plenty of time for your questions. So please feel free, feel free throughout the session to post questions in the Q&A function, and we will get to as many as we can. A bit of background first. A year ago, last December, Charlie McMahon, our interim CIO, and I spoke to the University Senate regarding proposed changes under consideration regarding our email platforms, Google and Microsoft 365. Based on that conversation and subsequent conversations, OCEDA was formed out of a need for more cross-campus dialogue and investigation into Stony Brook's technology platforms, equipment, usage, <coughs> services. Fundamentally, our charge is understanding how our community uses technology whether you're a staff member, educator, clinician, researcher, administrator, or a student, we acknowledge that all our stakeholders have specific and varying needs, and we're working toward IT solutions that will serve our diverse community. And OCITO is working to identify the risks, challenges, and opportunities of unifying the institution through shared technology resources. With the long-term goal of improving collaboration and productivity, reducing costs, and eliminating redundancy. Our executive uh, sponsors include myself, Carol Gomes, who's CEO of the hospital, Charlie McMahon, our interim CIO, and myself. Before I turn the conversation over to our co-chairs and based on questions we received in advance of our conversation, let me just plainly state that there are no plans to shift platforms, all right? No plans to shift email or uh, platforms at all. While there's a pilot happening in the division of IT, independent from Alcito, to investigate interoperability between platforms once our identity and access management work has been completed, should this, the pilot be successful, this will provide faculty, staff, and students the opportunity to choose the platform that best meets their needs. Again, I want to emphasize the word choose. And so we begin today. And as we begin, I'd like to introduce Matt Therakin, who will provide us an overview of the work underway. Matt? Thanks, Rose. So to summarize, the work that we've been doing since March was to start off with, we formed three task forces. The first one was on the inventory of software that we use across the campuses. The second would be identity and access management, and third would be IT governance. And we're going to speak about those in the, uh, the forthcoming slides. We also did a, uh, a survey, which was across all the Stony Brook University campuses. And we really wanted to learn about how well IT solutions worked and discover potential problems. We had about 1,500 respondents with 5,000 comments, which we read through. And a majority of our, our, our respondents were from the West Campus, about 57%. Next slide. Over here, we're... Uh, I'm going to pass it over to Erez, who's going to discuss the survey. Thank you, Matt. Um, I'd like to give you some high level overview of the survey comments or the sort of the most common themes that we have seen from the survey. Uh, one of the biggest themes has been that lots of people were concerned and complained about having too many accounts, too many passwords, logins, websites. It was so hard to keep up. It was slowing everyone down. Um, it was also difficult to collaborate at times and lots of lost productivity. If you wanted to email somebody, you didn't know really which email to use because everybody has so many different email accounts. If you wanted to coordinate meetings, uh, you couldn't find the right calendar so you can find out when people are available for scheduling meetings. <clears throat> and if you wanted to share documents and work with them collaboratively, uh, for a good segment of the population, this was hard to impossible. Even this group itself has found it very difficult to collaborate because we are spanning the entire enterprise. 
Uh, many people had expressed concerns about the applications that we use. They're like kind of outdated, poor user experience, just to name a few um, Solar, Cerner, Blackboard, Wolfmart, my research. Um, some uh, people have been using the Google, Gmail, and Zoom suite, and they expressed a slightly higher satisfaction than those who use the Microsoft uh, Office and Teams suite, uh, but just a slightly higher. A, a lot of people had complain about having old computers, five, seven, 10 year old computers or old networks, they're running old software, they can't be updated, they can't be upgraded, uh, they don't run things. The next set of comments had to do with IT support services. Um, for many people, it was slow to respond, slow actions, the process to submit a ticket was too cumbersome uh, or took too much paperwork. Uh, some users were actually being bounced around between different IT organizations and there was still also a recognition that a lot of the IT staff are working their best, working very hard and are overloaded and understaffed. Additionally, uh, many users uh, wanted access to site-wide software licenses, such as Adobe, Piazza, and Slack, uh, that people are using to get their work done. What was very interesting is that nearly half of all respondents said that they've been using at least one personal device or software that they purchased to get their own work done. Uh, that's a pretty significant percentage right there. So the, soft, the software inventory. So we basically created a, a library uh, by working with IT leadership and an interdisciplinary group of technical owners and users. And what we did was we reviewed the software applications and we categorized them and identified how they were used. And our findings were that there were around 502 total software packages. About 333 of them were healthcare specific and about 169 of them were non-healthcare specific. When we look at the categories, you know, some of the heavy hitters were security, productivity, HR, databases, LMS reporting. They had multiple software solutions in those categories. Now, some of the work that we have yet to do, which is coming, is actually ask the questions in these categories of, are there uh, functional equivalents there? Are there old legacy applications which have no security controls on them? Is there wasted money in IT support and buying things that, buying software applications that are basically do the same thing? So right now we have the categories and the list of applications. One of the task forces that were formed under ACITO is to investigate identity and access management, or IAM. The motivation, which was confirmed by numerous comments in the survey, is people have too many accounts, too many logins, too many passwords. There are different IT organizations that run their own user directories and passwords. There's sometimes very poor integration and access controls with some of the applications that users are using. It is actually time consuming to get the right access for users. It could take weeks and even months. We've heard from some users that said uh, when they were hired, they were waiting for weeks and even more than a month before they got the access to do their work. And it's equally difficult to remove access or to change the access where needed. So the current status is that the productivity is being hurt because of this. Uh, there are some serious security and regulatory compliance risks, not just to the organizations, but also potentially to individuals. And there are higher costs overall. I want to emphasize that IAM is a critical foundational technology. You first have to solve this before you can potentially resolve any kind of effective collaborations in other of these many applications that we have. So the goals of the, the task force are to develop plans for an enterprise-wide identity management program to reduce the total number of logins and passwords needed by users, ideally to just one. I want you to envision one day in which in the morning you log into a single portal that's secure and, and with a single uh, set of credentials, and it gives you access to all the applications that you need to do your work uh, throughout the, the day. Um, we want to be able to create accounts more quickly and grant the right access as well as revoke the access as needed, and therefore manage the risk, liability, and regulatory compliance. The process that we have done is that the task force comprises both business and IT stakeholders, and both from East and West campuses to have the appropriate representations that span the entire enterprise. 
And we are engaging consultant companies who know a lot about this topic for many years, and even our peer institutions who either have gone through this process or are going through it to learn from their experiences. Next, I'd like to introduce Margaret Chadell, who will tell you about IT governance. So it is crucial for the long-term success of these other initiatives to have integrated IT governance. And I did not know what IT governance was either when I started this. So I read this book on IT governance. And basically it's an alignment of policies and procedures that ensure effective and efficient use of IT. So successful governance is unified, effective, rational, transparent, and works top down and bottom up. And when I say unified, I mean that everyone from students to the president agrees to follow these policies. And so they can't be burdensome. There can't be a reason to try to find a loophole to get around it. Specifically at Stony Brook, IT governance means creating a pipeline for managing our limited investments to generate strategic values for education, research, healthcare, business, and diversity. And those of you who are familiar with our mission statement should recognize those five pillars. So in addition to the book that we got on governance, we looked at other peer institutions. And one thing we found really, really helpful was this flow chart from Tulane. And here you can see that there are large decisions and then branching decisions um, that happen within the committees. And the idea is that at every decision point, you will get an email telling you where you are in the process. So that is a way to ensure transparencies. So I thought I would give a hypothetical example in the future. If those of you who have been paying attention to the tech news, you know that Facebook is now meta. Um, and meta is gonna be a way for people to get into augmented reality. So sort of what um, mail is to internet, the internet is to augmented reality. And you can imagine in the future that Stony Brook is going to have to figure out which platform we're going to access the metaverse in. And there is going to be significant implications for education, research, business, healthcare, and diversity. So for example, one might, platform might have an incredible healthcare app that all the doctors think is really great, but maybe it doesn't have a support for vision impaired people. And so what's gonna happen is governance is going to have to decide how to balance those competing interests. So what has our task force done so far? We've already decided that there will be a single intake form and purview over discussion rights. We've already th thought about and spec'd out the IT role of governance process. We are currently working on the governance structure. So what are the verticals or the subcommittees? And we still have to figure out what the senior leadership roles will be. We're going to put sample processes through this draft governance framework, establish that governance framework based on those samples, and finally present to the leadership in February. Wish us luck. So our next steps. Um... So basically, OSITO is a recommending group. So in the next few months, as, as Megan said, we're going to develop, <clears throat> we're going to deliver the software inventory, uh, a IT governance process and procedures, and also a IAM report, which is put together by the group and the consultants. And uh, we'll make the recommendations to senior leadership. Questions? Matt, Ariz, and Meg, thank you so much for giving us an overview of the work that you've done. Um, prior to this session, we actually solicited questions from the community. And uh, while we get started in this question and answer period, I would also encourage you, if you have questions, to submit them through the Q&A function. So one question that came up early um, in those that were submitted and also came up during the University Senate meeting last week was the notion of the LMS. And so I, would, I have invited Elizabeth Newman, our Vice Provost for Curriculum and Undergraduate Education to join us. And so let me ask this question of her. Has a decision been made about changing our LMS? And if we do change, what support will there be for faculty to transfer files and learning materials? Elizabeth, welcome and thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for including me, Rose, and um, I'm happy to talk about this topic. So I think um, there's been a lot of worry about the LMS, and the headline is, yes, 
Blackboard is going away. Um, Blackboard is going away because the company that owns Blackboard is ending this product. It's an end of life product now. Um, they have a new version called Blackboard Ultra, which does not look anything like the Blackboard you either love or hate currently. Um, it's a totally new, different product. Um, because we knew this was coming up, uh, SUNY actually formed an LMS committee um, a couple of years ago, and that's because 48 of the SUNY campuses were using Blackboard. So they knew this was an issue that was going to have to be addressed as uh, the Blackboard that we're using now, Blackboard Learn phased out. Uh, so they brought in committee members from the various campuses, including our own Diana Voss here from uh, Stony Brook, and they spent a long time going through a lengthy RFP process, evaluating the competing programs, and ultimately SUNY settled on Desire to Learn's Brightspace as the next LMS. Um, the, um, we could easily just accept that and go forward with that. However, because we have such diverse and complex needs here at Stony Brook, uh, CELT has been working under the leadership of Rose Tirada uh, to gather faculty together who are assessing the needs of our faculty and seeing if Brightspace is going to deliver on that. So they're currently meeting um, in uh, their, their meetings are ongoing. If you have concerns and you haven't been included in that conversation, you should feel free to reach out, reach out to Rose Tirada. Um, but they're evaluating it very closely. We do have the option of going out on our own RFP. However, we have to make that decision very quickly. Ideally, migration to the new LMS needs to begin in the spring of 2022, which is right around the corner. Um, and so that's, that's a pretty quick turnaround time. Uh, in terms of the support that we're looking at, um, Do It intends to migrate all of your course materials from your old platform to the new platform. Um, and so that should be taken care of for you. And additionally, um, pending the details of extending contracts and all of that sort of thing. Uh, the uh, hope is to run the existing version of Blackboard in parallel with the new system for a year so that people have the opportunity uh, to switch when they're comfortable and ready and so that there is a transition period. Um, I think, does that answer your question, Rose? It does indeed, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. We may, if you could stay around for just a few minutes, we might get a few extra questions. So thank you. Absolutely. All right, Meg, first question from our group. How will faculty and staff be able to have input in the IT governance process? So currently we are figuring out what those verticals are or those subcommittees are going to be for IT governance. And so if you are interested, and please, please be interested, reach out to me. You can look at the Osito website and find out what we're doing and where your skills could be utilized the best. Great, thanks, Meg. Uh, this question is for Matt. Uh, a large number of faculty use Linux. Is the committee ensuring that all future applications and platforms are fully Linux compliant? So what we're doing right now is we're definitely in the discovery phase and a big tenant of Osito is to identify the, the needs of our constituency and, and listen. We're in the listening process and we will take into account all the needs and we're not looking for a one, one solution fits all. We're looking for to kind of amplify and improve productivity and collaboration. So we will be listening to any of the needs, whether it's Linux or, or whatnot. Great, thanks, Matt. I'm gonna come back to you, Elizabeth, uh, another LMS. So on the topic of LMS, will RSOM or the Renaissance School of Medicine be brought in too, or will CBASE continue to be used? So um, currently, um, Rose Tirada has actually involved the um, School of Medicine faculty in the evaluation of Brightspace. And so that is part of an ongoing assessment of making sure that whatever LMS system we have meets their requirements. Eris, let's take this question for you. Do the survey results actually play a role in these decisions? 
Absolutely. Uh, we, we wanted to hear what the community has to say, and we were very happy to have uh, 1,500 respondents and you know hundreds of pages of, of, of thousands of comments that we all reviewed. We're still analyzing this, this treasure trove of data, uh, but absolutely, this data is going to drive a number of decisions, and there may be some additional surveys. Uh, the importance is that this data confirm in our mind that the uh, the tracks that we're pursuing are the right ones, building the foundations. First of all, finding out what do we have in terms of inventory, the need for governance that can help make the big picture decisions while giving flexibility to individual units, and building the identity and access management that is so foundational to all the other applications and all the other software that is being used around. Thanks, Aaron. All right, uh, I'm gonna give this to Meg. Uh, one of the most distracting and anti-productivity aspects of work life at Stony Brook is excessive email. Zillions of CCs repeatedly forwarded identical emails and announcements. Is there any way to streamline and filter the onslaught of semi-junk email? Oh, I wish I would know the answer. Meg, you got an answer for us? <laughs> Why did you ask me that, Rose? Um, Wow, uh, let's think about that. I think um, it's really hard to control email, um, but what we can do with IT governance is maybe make it a little easier to um, sign up to the list that you want to be on and make sure that you're not on the list you shouldn't be. Um, for example, I um, was not on the provost's mailing list for a bit there and I was missing announcements like crazy. So we need to make sure that there is a way that you get the, the email you want and not the ones you don't. Thanks, Meg. All right. So I've got another question that seems to be asked often. So I'm going to take this on myself. So can you confirm that Gmail, Google Drive, et cetera, will stay? And I can say, yes, absolutely. So we are exploring identity and access management in order for us to have more seamless and secure interaction, um, interoperability across all our platforms. Right now, we do not have that. If you are as lucky as this team has been, uh, when you have Meg and Erez on the West Campus and Matt on the East Campus, they can't even share files. And so when you're talking about some of the different systems, the interoperability is really challenging. But we made a decision as a university as we, ex as we explored identity and access management that we wanna be inclusive and eventually allow our faculty, students, and staff to choose which of the platforms best suits their needs. And so that's the intent. Now it's gonna take us a while to implement the identity and access management uh, initiative and work, uh, workflows, um, but the intent is to continue to support all platforms that support our people. All right, next question. Um, uh, I'm going to go with Matt. Has there been any consideration of a campus-wide project management system that allows teams to work together on projects, a system that includes teams, tasks, timelines, et cetera, like Asana? Well, that's, <clears throat> that's a good question. It, it relates to the inventory. So we do have that inventory category of project management. And, you know, as we assess what we have, we'll also be engaging with the, uh, uh, with the users to see what we need and uh, and see what uh, what opportunities we have. So again, like we're mostly in the uh, discovery phase and we're looking at the inventory that we have. We're, we're not per se looking at this point to make any decisions just yet. We're more in the listening of figuring out what, what the pain points are. So if that's one of the pain points, then we could definitely look into that. Great, thanks, Matt. Uh, here's another question. The one campus strategy for IT has been tried unsuccessfully before. What's different this time? And why do you think it will succeed? Erez. That's a very good question. Um, uh, first, uh, we feel that um, this is a new administration that's receptive to these longstanding issues and willing to take the time and efforts to uh, investigate things uh, carefully and methodically with all the right stakeholders. Um, it, it's going to take time because we are not, we didn't get here overnight, um, but uh, we are starting from the foundations that are important 
uh, and engaging as many of the stakeholders as possible. Again, just finding out the inventory of software that we have supported and what does it mean is, is a big task in its own right. Building this governance across the entire enterprise um, is also important. So we can see the big picture and, and make decisions that are more effective for everyone. And finally, again, having the identity and access management so everyone can have this single identity that's secure and can be act can be interfaced with all the applications that they need. Those foundations are important. Thank you. All right, another question here. Um, if almost 70% of survey respondents found it easy to work with others and only 7% found it hard, why would Stony Brook disrupt the systems of the whole institution to address the needs of such a small group? I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna ask Meg to, to answer this one. Yeah, thank you, Rose. Um, so it's, it's so great that you all are not experiencing some of the pain points that we are. But for the people that are collaborating across campuses, it's been really, really difficult for us. Um, as Rose said, in this committee, we're already facing that difficulty. The slide deck that you just saw, um, at one point, Matt did not have access to it. And so those 7% of people that express those pain points are really having trouble. And the idea is not to get rid of anything. Again, as Rose said, it's to make sure it's inclusive and using um, the identity and access management will have one login that does enable those collaborations to happen. So ideally, there will not be a disruption to the people that are not having problems, but the people who are, Hopefully this will solve a lot of those headaches and encourage more collaboration across campuses. Thanks, Meg. Now, um, I'd like to encourage you all to keep the questions flowing. We're beginning to come to the end of our questions and we still have plenty of time. So uh, I'm gonna go and ask uh, Eras to talk to this one. Uh, thanks to COVID-19, Many of us discovered advantages of administrating, administering exams online via Blackboard, but we can't do this in large in-person classes. Not everyone, every student has a laptop that they can bring to the lecture hall on the date and time of an exam. When, if at all, might we have large lecture halls with embedded technology to enable in-person online exams? Great question. So uh, those of us during the pandemic who have tried to run online exams with various technologies like Respondus and Lockdown Browser have found it to be fairly challenging. We found these technologies to be uh, difficult and, and fragile. Um, if, if we want to have exams uh, in person in rooms, um, we're going to have to have, um, first of all, an IT governance that can uh, figure out the right ways to equip all the rooms that we have with the right technologies and refresh that technology as well. So it, it meets the needs of, of a future in which we might be teaching hybrid classes where some are in person and some are remote. And those are you know, well-known technological challenges that we have right now. Thanks, Harris. Elizabeth, if you're still around, um, this question is about the LMS. Does the new LMS work with Respondus? Many yep. classes have to have it for exams. Yep, no problem. We uh, made sure to take that off the list. Awesome, thank you. All right, back over to you, Meg, for IT governance. How does the IT governance impact the procurement process when requesting purchases for technology? Will there be new timelines required for the additional approvals assessment? So the idea is, again, thinking back to that flowchart, to have one point of entry, and it really depends on the complexity of the ask, right? So it might be very fast if we determine it does not have to go through governance structure if it is inexpensive or is not going to interface with the network. Ideally, this is not going to slow down the purchasing process, um, and hopefully it will actually speed up productivity because when we get those products, we will be sure that they are supported, that they work with our infrastructure, and um, that we're not duplicating efforts. So if somebody already has a license, for example, we'll know about it and be able to give that license to you and use those economies of scale. Thanks, Meg. Um, I have a question that's probably pretty broad. So I'm gonna have Matt start um, and then others can chime in. Um, if Stony Brook will uniformly support both systems, Microsoft and Google in particular, 
how will IT support teams who, who, who the survey identified already are overworked? So the IT support teams. Um, are there plans to extend IT support areas? I'm gonna start with Matt. And I know that there's an IAM kind of aspect to this as well. That's gonna do a lot of the streamlining in the background, which is where we spend a lot of time. But Matt, you wanna give us a, a start to that answer? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as the, as the, as the process goes on, if we identify the needs that there are needs to be more people, then that's going to have to be one of the considerations that we take into account. Um, again, we're, we're going to recommend what we think is the best uh, solution. We're going to say, this is what the people have said. This is what our situation is and then make recommendations. So um, as far as will we hire more people, uh, I think the the verdict is still out, depending on what solutions we come up with. Aris, you want to add to that around the IAM and the, some of the streamlining that might come from that as well? Yes, I think um, it, we've spoken to a lot of IT experts, and we found out where they're spending their times on things that could be potentially automated. So the fact that um, users have so many accounts and emails is costing a lot of time in manually allowing people access from here and from there. Um, some of you know that in addition to the Google suite and the Microsoft suite, we also have another setup for sharing document called Box. And the group that is working just on Box is spending an incredible amount of their own time manually setting up access to groups that to users that need to share files across all the campuses. So we're hoping that by um, creating the identity and access management and all these other processes, we can effectively make uh, the IT um, staff there themselves uh, happier not to have to deal with a lot of these menial repeated tasks and be able to uh, engage in something more intellectually challenging. And so they will be more effective as well, not just the rest of the user community. Thanks, Aris. Uh, I'm going to start with Matt on this, but I'm going to go to Meg after this. So this is Stony Brook Medicine seems to have a more streamlined IT structure than the university. Why don't we just implement that system on the West Campus? So let's start with you, Matt, and maybe Meg can chime in as well. Well, working at Stony Brook Medicine, we do have an effective IT governance, but I think the goal of Osito is not really to look for like a one size fits all solution for a cross campus. Instead, again, like I've said, like we're, we're looking to meet the uh, learn about the diverse uh, institutional needs and look for solutions that align with our one campus strategy and really allow us to collaborate seamlessly. Our, <clears throat> our goal is to have a governance structure that looks at the big picture and also, you know, actually help um, whatever we're doing good on Stony Brook Medicine side, we're looking to maybe expand those processes to the West Campus as well. So we do have a good governance process. And, but, you know, one size doesn't fit all. And we understand that there's diverse needs amongst the campuses. Thanks, Matt. Meg, you wanna chime in there as well? Yeah, we are leaning very hard on the expertise of uh, the hospital side on our IT governance subcommittee, um, particularly, um, John and Bell are really, really familiar with the IT structure, IT governance structure on that side. And so to even like advance, uh, Bridget uh, has a question in the in the chat on IT specific projects. So if you go back to imagining that uh, flow chart, the second something comes in that is only healthcare specific, it will transition seamlessly back into that hospital IT governance structure. So we're really making sure that we don't mess up what is already working. That's great, Meg. And, and one of the things that I think is really important, um, our executive sponsors, Carol Gomes, uh, Charlie McMahon, and myself are really thinking about trying to not add bureaucracy, but just add clear pathways for decisions so that we can accelerate um, the approval processes and get down to the, the, uh, the business of implementing and using those systems going forward. So thank you for that. Um, here's another question. When I seek help from IT, I get bounced around between departments. Can we simplify the process for requesting IT service? Eris, let's go with you to start on that one. Uh, absolutely. Part of the um, 
the IT governance work that we're doing is to allow for a single simple intake form for submitting tickets. Those of you who have had the experience of trying to submit uh, IT tickets, whether it's on the east or west side, you know that you have to go through like half a dozen, uh, sorry, two dozen questions and clicks and buttons and selecting before you can actually uh, request something. It should be much, much simpler uh, a process. And then it gets funneled and assigned to the right people or diverted to the right uh, IT group. So that is part of the goal. Thanks, Aaron's. Uh, here's another question that's more about uh, software. So I'm going to hand this over to Matt. Many faculty purchase individual Overleaf and Dropbox subscriptions. Are those being considered for purchase by the university? So we are looking at all the software. So you know whether it's uh, whether it's Dropbox or whatnot. One of the one of the things that we have identified is the fact that people don't have the equipment that they need or the software that they need, and they have to spend their own money. So <clears throat> based off of that, we'll look at our software solutions, why they are or are not working, and, and look at how we can uh, look at where we're failing and look at how we could uh, to meet the needs of our, our community where they, where they are. And right now we see that, you know, whether it's the software or the uh, hardware, people are spending their own money on, on work. Great, thanks, Matt. Uh, we did get a number of questions about IT and AV support for classrooms, conference rooms, and event spaces. Is there a plan to expedite those requests and get them to the right IT team? Uh, let's go with Meg on this one to start. So again, one of the most frustrating things that I've experienced on campus is when I'm in the healthcare side trying to run a meeting and something isn't working and I don't know which IT group to go to. And so what we want to do is have that single point of entry, make it super simple and ideally then a little bit more responsive because you will know where you're going. <laughs> you don't have to go through the wrong paths to get the right answer. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, okay, here's another one. Um, I think Matt, this is more about hospital and academic missions. So let me give this to you. The hospital and academic missions are sometimes very different, very much agree there. How do you plan to realign IT to ensure those missions are supported efficiently through the IT governance structure so we can continue to, be ha to, continue to have cutting edge research, innovation, and education? So I think Meg touched on this a little bit when we talked about the IT governance. So in, as you saw in the inventory, there's a large portion of, of healthcare specific uh, software. And when it comes to healthcare specific issues, there would be an avenue in the IT governance to say, this is healthcare specific and, you know, and then it would go off onto that path. So, you know, as we said, like Stony, uh, SBMIT and Stony Brook Medicine do have pretty effective governance structure. So we would not want to kind of observe that or, or interrupt that in any way. Thanks, Matt. This is a good question. I'm gonna put this to you, Meg. One reason that people have developed workarounds and buy their own software and hardware is often because of decisions that ignore key requirements of particular departments or user types. We have encountered this often in psychiatry, for example. The consolidation approaches you mentioned seem like they make, make this worse. How will you permit relatively unique needs to be addressed? First of all, hi, Laura, thank you for your question. Um, so we totally understand that research team have specific tools that need specific tools to do their work. Um, I, for example, need a very specific kind of computer that did not blur my background. Uh, so I had to borrow a computer today to do what I needed to do for this panel. Um, and the idea here is not to prevent research teams from purchasing and using the tools you need. Rather, the goal of IT governance is to create a strong framework and a set of processes for purchasing, maintaining, and supporting systems that serve the entire institution. But if a specific research team needs a specific tool, we are gonna get out of the way, unless it comes to security. Yeah, no, well, I think that the issue here is always university security, um, but as a university, um, we, we have to manage um, HIPAA cons uh, constraints, FERPA constraints, and just overall security and ports into not um, uh, having bad actors come in and, and, and uh, uh, wreak havoc on, on the university. So 
there's an awful lot to this that we're trying through the identity and access management or IT governance, and, and in many ways, understanding what systems we use to optimally use them um, is just the foundation of a lot of work that's going to go on long beyond this committee. So this committee provides us with the foundation, but there'll be many other steps that will uh, fall after this as we become what we'll call a little bit more effective and efficient in uh, using tools, identifying tools, sunsetting tools, et cetera, as we go forward as an institution. Um, okay, let's, uh, this is, this is a, a question and I'm going to go back to Matt about software tools. So if we want to suggest some software or apps that Stony Brook does not have, where can we submit our suggestions? Ooh, this is a big one because they're so decentralized. Well, that's where the that's where the single source in the uh, a single source to for our end users to kind of come into whether it's a help desk there would be a single place where you can put suggestions in or requests so and that would be part of uh, something that it governance would set up once as a as a central source to get these inputs in yeah. so that's where i would see that going yeah I think one of the interesting things that I've learned over my time here is um, in many ways we're fairly siloed or federated. Um, and because so much of the work that we do around IT, IT spends technology, laptops, hardware is, is uh, purchased locally and it's dependent on the unit budget. Um, there hasn't been a lot of what I would call shared discussions about um, buying university-based tools in the ways that we might. And IT governance is what we hope will be a pathway for addressing some of those concerns going forward. Um, I have a couple questions that are about how much we spend. Um, this group is not focused on how much we spend on IT staffing. I can tell you some of the work that this group has done is identified that we are deeply fractured in our IT. We have central, uh, which is on the West Campus. We have on the East Campus, most colleges have their own, most units have their own, many departments have their own. And so what we know is we were expand, um, our expenditures in this area are fairly large and broad just because of how um, decentralized we are. But that will be something that will be studied more from the CIOs now that we have um, uh, uh, our uh, new leadership on both sides of the campus to, to start to help us think through those things. All right, I have another question here that just came in about a rehearsal period before classes start. So let me just read this here, just lost it. Can we have a designated rehearsal period before each semester when both IT and classroom support is fully staffed and classrooms are open to enable faculty to catch up and practice with the updates to operating systems and software. Oh, I'm gonna give this to Eris. Oh, Meg wants to go, go Meg. <laughs> so, as a person that teaches in one of these labs, uh, I totally feel that pain. Um, and something I found, I had to be proactive about this in order to get in a week before and make sure everything was working. So I think that's a fabulous idea to not put the burden on the professor to have to reach out, but to rather reverse that and say, we, we're, we are ready and please come and try this. Um, and then of course the faculty has to be willing to come in before classes start. Um, but I think that is a great suggestion. Great, Elizabeth, you wanna chime in as well? Sure, sorry, I had a small, ironically small technical difficulty there for a moment. Um, I agree, I think this is a great idea um, and it's the first time I've had someone suggest it and um, I'm super excited about it. So I'm gonna talk to people and see if we could do something about that because I also know I certainly have had my pre-semester anxiety of what am I gonna find in the classroom when I get there to teach. So uh, I'll see what we can do. I just got a text from my co-chair, Mike. Hi, for, thanks for listening. Uh, and Mike says, we do offer this service. So I guess we just need to uh, centralize our messaging around this and we will figure out how to make sure more people know about it. Thanks, Mike. I love it. All right, here's another question. Are you taking into consideration the needs of those who do extensive collaboration with individuals at other universities rather than just East versus West campus interchange? And I would just say, Absolutely, but Eris, you wanna talk a little bit more about that? 
Yes, absolutely. For, first, uh, we should recognize that this is a large enterprise and it's not just the East versus West. There's a, a lot of smaller satellite campuses who are also fairly important and they want and deserve their voices to be heard. And so we want the entire enterprise to work. We know that many people are collaborating um, across organizations all over the world. And we want to ensure that everyone will have the access to the tools that they um, like and use that make their work more effective um, and not really to force one to use one tool versus another. Yeah, well, that's great. Thank you. We are coming down to the last questions here, so keep them running. Uh, Jonathan, I don't know how much SVU spends on IT, but we'll make sure some of that work gets done. Uh, okay. This is another respondus question. Elizabeth, perhaps you will do that. Uh, currently with, with respondus, you need to watch the videos to actually even attempt to catch those who may be cheating. The system does not identify correctly those who may be cheating. In fact, those found have been in the low chance category. With 570 students in a class, faculty need staff to watch these videos and identify potential cheaters. In other words, the system it, um, has a very large gap in usability. What are we doing about this issue? I think this is an ongoing issue of concern that we've really been wrestling with since before the um, start of the pandemic even. And um, I think that uh, we don't have a good resolution or solution for the system yet. Um, but as we see which LMS we're moving forward with and what integrations it has, I think that's something that's really uh, very prominent on the radar to try and sort out. Yeah. I, I can yeah. add a little, a little bit to that, that uh, the, the pandemic has of course accelerated uh, the need for taking safe online exams all over the world in different time zones and different places with different uh, network connectivity. And um, we know that these technologies are still in their infancy. They are being developed because of the interest. There are lots of companies out there working on it, using various uh, techniques from AI and facial recognition and more to try and, and make for a better and better experience for both the, the exam takers and for the proctors so that eventually you, uh, a, a, and a, a proctor can have only a small set of videos or segments of videos and portions that they can investigate directly to see if there is anything um, there. So this is still evolving technology and all the LMS companies are looking into it. Thanks, Harris. Uh, uh, Meg, I think this is gonna be for you because this is probably gonna come out of IT governance. Are you still going to allow individual departments with additional funds to purchase hardware according to their own specifications? as long as they exceed in any minimum requirements outlined, i.e. upgraded cell phones, laptops, monitors, et cetera. Absolutely. And this is a governance absolutely. issue. Yep, we are absolutely going to allow that. There are going to be, have to be some checks, as we said, about some security issues. Uh, there are software packages that have real security gaps that we have found out about. And so it's just gonna have to go through a very quick check to make sure that they, do not compromise our systems, but yes, absolutely. But I'm gonna counter that and say no, um, because there are some minimum standards that are gonna to need to be required. And as we start to consolidate, um, what um, this is gonna go into a crazy world, is that we have all types of people um, and types of systems and vendors doing cell phones. And we as a university are beginning to think about how do we consolidate those contracts? So there may be some things that will get grandfathered in and then changed over time. So I don't wanna say carte blanche, of course, because there are enormous amounts of savings through some standardization and, um, uh, and alignment of policies. And we're just exploring that as a university. It's not the purview of this group, but I did wanna just jump, jump in that there are discussions about how to glue together some of the work that we're doing around uh, the many contracts we have for cell phones and so, cell phone usage, and et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. I can also Aaron. just add a little bit that part of the surprise of doing the software inventory is finding, first of all, that there were so many of them. 
supported. So over 500 supported applications. We, we don't even know what is the count of unsupported applications or what is the count of supported applications outside of these two large IT organizations, SBMIT and do it. Likely there's a few hundred more. And so the count was, the large count was one surprise. The second surprise was there's so many things that appear to be very similar. And so we expect that in some future date, if somebody says, I want to purchase this functionality, rather than going off and spending their own money in some potentially less effective way, they might be able to piggyback on an existing license and just incrementally get a few more licenses, which would be just more cost effective. But there has to be a place where you know what, what is the inventory of all software, hardware capabilities that we have so you can make the most informed and most efficient decision. Thanks, Eris. Here's another question. It's more technical. Um, it's probably more for us to be thinking about um, and for those on the phone from perhaps uh, Division of IT to listen to as well. So the difficulties mentioned with submitting help desk tickets seems to be getting worse with Churwell. It often makes it hard to figure out what's happening with the ticket. Any chance that it can be improved or replaced? And I just leave that out there for those listening on the technology side. Uh, to perhaps address that. And we'll follow up with some answers uh, from IT directly. All right, here's another one. Uh, we found that all the classroom computers were changed from Macs to window PCs. I didn't know that happened. Uh, this decision created a sizable problem for a large number of faculty in biological sciences who use keynotes rather than PowerPoint. How was this decision made and were any faculty consulted? How will this be addressed moving forward? Okay, this is a great governance question. Again, so many of the decisions that we make are made um, in pockets. And so I'm gonna give this to Meg and uh, we'll see, uh, we'll bring this up to our desktop and classroom technology, which has not from my uh, point of view, uh, been standardized or used completely uh, and all throughout all our campus buildings. And so that, I think we're a little bit behind on classroom technology compared to other tools. But Meg, please start. Yeah, as a as a devoted keynote user myself, I, I feel that pain. I don't know um, who runs your um, classroom systems, so I can't speak to the past, but I can speak to the future, which is that we really want to have this governance structure in place that during those points of decision making, there will be input from the stakeholders. And that's really crucially important to actually having a successful IT governance is not just that there's rules, but th those rules work. Right. Uh, I have another staffing related question. So I'm just gonna pull this out um, and maybe arrows you can take this. Uh, Slate has become been becoming a more of a mission critical system over the past three years for marketing admissions, et cetera. Uh, when will new positions be added to meet these Slate commitments? Um, I, I, I guess the question is about uh, more staff that would support the uh, the Slate instances. Um, so. I think this is again a, a, a question that will have to come from the uh, IT governance and looking at the, the needs for resources. I understand that, first of all, there, there's, there has been a significant effort converting from Apply Yourself to Slate. There were several instances of Slate. There, there's, there are efforts to try and merge them and unify them um, already underway. So this is already a process that, that's happening, uh, not necessarily because of this uh, committee's work and we're, we're happy to see that ongoing. But uh, conversations about staffing obviously are going to have to happen uh, in strategic ways, like where do we need more staff and what kind of expertise, where staff could be um, become more effective because their work becomes easier through to automation. Those are still ongoing conversations. Right. Thanks, Erez. Uh, so I think there's just one last question here. Uh, oh, there's two more that just came in. <laughs> uh, one is, will you be able to share the whole survey responses? And we're going to post the survey responses on the Strategic Initiative Diocito website, which is available online. Um, and the second question is, I think for Matt, another issue is how to keep track of licenses to ensure we are compliant. 
So <clears throat> we that's one of the things that we're looking at in the inventory. And they actually do have like software programs that can look at uh, software suites and also keep track of the licenses and uh, and when your um, when your contracts expire and whatnot. So um, you know that's part of what we're going to be doing, looking at uh, you know compiling um, the licenses and and what's what's a site wide license, what's enterprise, what's not, and uh, that's some of the work that we're going to be doing in the future. Great, thank you, Matt. Well, I think we're coming to the end of our hour together. Um, there's one last question that I'd like to address. Um, and then uh, we'll just kind of go around and do some last comments going on here. So will a timeline of the rollout be posted somewhere? So I just want to first say we are a recommending body. And so our recommendations will be finalized between December and February of this year uh, for a number of activities in, around um, uh, IAM. IT governance and our inventory. And so those things will be coming forward. Those recommendations will then be posted on our website and any timelines around that will be shared with on the website and with the community. Um, I wanna thank Meg and Matt and Erez and Elizabeth for uh, all the work that they're doing to support the university on your behalf. This is all about ensuring that we have appropriate voice into the decisions around such an important part of how we work together. And I wanna thank you as well for joining us today. We will post um, an FAQ on our website with any of the questions that we didn't get to, but I do believe we got through all of them. Um, we'll post the recording. And of course we will uh, be welcome to um, have any conversations or any emails, please send them directly to either Meg, Erez or Matt or myself, and we'll take them up into our committee. But we so appreciate your time today and thank you very much. Have a great day.